is Riley Moore, treasurer of the state and candidate for congressional district number two. And we've worked our way through all the candidates for congressional district number two, uh, or at least the ones we've been communicating with throughout the campaign in the last uh, week and a half or two here. And Riley is uh, right now, according to the polls that you see, the person who's in the lead. Riley, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me back on. Always good to be back in studio with you all. Mm -hmm. Time-honored tradition for me. This has been going on... Uh, 12 years? Yeah, 10 years, something like that, and yeah. I always come back in. So. What year did you first run for delegates? 16. 16. 16. So around 15 is the first time that we were talking to you. I think your, your earpiece yeah. came out there. That's okay. That's all right. You still have to hear me? <laughs> <laughs> not, not in the least, no. Yeah. So... Uh, my first question to you in regards to transportation, did you skateboard your way over here today or a more traditional way of transporting yourself there? You say that one more time. Did you skate? Did you, are your headphones still out? Yeah. yeah. Just forget them then. Yeah, yeah. Did you skateboard your way over here today? Uh, I did not, uh, but I don't know if y'all saw like Tim Poole who does his podcast. Uh, he built us a big skate park. I went and I skated at it and, uh, Man, I, I'm think? not as young as I used to be. No, uh, none of us I, is. That, that took a couple weeks of, like, recovery. Mm -hmm. I didn't, like, fall or get hurt. I'm just old. <laughs> like, it's just... No, you're not old. Uh, to, be on a Bill's old. to be on a skateboard, I'm probably a little old, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, let's, let's talk seriously for a moment here as we get to, to the final uh, day and a half of election season. Why should you be the congressional pick out of a crowded field here? Well, uh, you know... Folks in this area, y'all know me. I, I have a proven conservative track record. Uh, I had one of the most conservative voting records in the state legislature when I was there. Uh, I actually received a couple awards for that, uh, for my conservative voting record as state treasurer. Uh, you know, I have fought back and won, and that's the important part to highlight, fight, fought back and won against a litany of corporate outside entities and the liberal elites that are trying to destroy West Virginia and our constitutional rights. And what do I mean by that is the first action that I took that really caught fire and we were able to start a um, national coalition around this effort was divesting our tax dollars from BlackRock due to their um, boycott of the fossil fuel industries here in West Virginia. And obviously I get to see those dollars and how much that means to the economy of the state of West Virginia. So now we have 12 states that have followed West Virginia billions and billions of dollars we've seen blackrock start to hedge we started the restricted financial institution list that said if you're boycotting the fossil fuel industry you can no longer contract with the state of west virginia for financial services we have put nearly 10 <coughs> nine pardon me uh, financial institutions on that list and in that process you know what we found is that there's a lot of people that wanted to compete for these contracts we've lost no money we're actually making more money than we ever have when i came into this office as a good steward of uh, the taxpayer dollars, we had six and a half billion dollars assets under management. We now have nearly twelve and a half billion dollars assets under management in the general revenue fund alone. We've grown the 529 account. I've started the Hope Scholarship account, stood that up, educational choice and freedom here in West Virginia. I protected your Second Amendment rights by prohibiting credit card companies from tracking the purchases of guns and ammunition here, not only in West Virginia, but in the country by creating liability for any time those pieces of information were shared, not subject to a warrant or subpoena. And that became national, uh, nationalized as well, where we had many other states follow our path here in West Virginia. So you've gotten proven, tested results that we have delivered here and I have delivered as the state treasurer of West Virginia, as previously your delegate, and that is what you're going to get if you elect me to Congress. William. Yeah, good morning, Riley. Uh, I understand recently you got a new um, uh, slug of money coming into you. Uh, that could be interpreted a couple different ways. One, that uh, they're very, very happy with the position you've taken. Also, that polls show that you're, there's uh, some of your opponents having a surge. Do you have a poll that would suggest are you still got the comfortable lead that you had before? Yeah. yeah, all the polls that we still have, internal and external, uh, still have us leading um, the way we've been leading, double digits. Um, yeah, I saw there were some commercials running on TV by some outside group. 
I don't know. Yeah, hey, maybe they just want to be on the winning team. I'm not sure, yeah. but they're yeah. running ads. Yeah. I have not seen those. Are the negative ad or positive ads? Positive. 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 Ads. Yeah. My campaign, we've only run positive ads. Mm -hmm. uh, my campaign specifically, the outside group, uh, they're running positive ads uh, as well, which I can't control that. I can't even talk to them. I'm just glad they're running positive because it's been a positive campaign. John Gilstrap. <clears throat> Assuming the state of the world is when you were to take office, what it is today. Uh, we got wars in Ukraine we, and in Israel, well, in, in Gaza involving Israel. Um, what's your stance on that? What would you be doing, your stance on denying Israel the, the weaponry and all of that that has been going on in the last six, eight months? Yeah, I'd say it, it's a tragedy what's going on right now as it relates to the Biden administration's actions and throttling uh, lethal aid to uh, the uh, IDF and the Israeli government writ large. Um, look, they, like any other nation, need to be able to defend and secure themselves. And it is actually in our interest for Israel to exist. Uh, it certainly is. And look, there's a lot of, uh, and the Admiral could probably tell you about this, uh, intelligence sharing and things like that that go in between us and Israel that help keep us safe as it relates to terrorist threats around the world that are targeted towards our interest here at home in the United States. They're the only democracy in the Middle East. So certainly we have to, and I think it is in our interest, in our national interest, to ensure that Israel still exists, because that is on the other side of this equation. They want to wipe Israel off the face of the map. They do not want Israel to exist. They do not want the Jews to exist in the world. They've made that very clear. They're calling for genocide. And, but as you know we're looking at all these pieces around the globe and all these issues that we have i don't think we can just run around being the policeman of the world we have to focus on what is our near peer threat and to me that is china and as we find ourselves in different conflicts here and there we do have to stay focused on what is our greatest adversary globally right now and i absolutely think that is china let me, so does that exclude Ukraine and Israel? Israel's not a threat to us. No, I've, yeah. the, the, uh, funding the, the war in Israel and funding the war, in, it's not an Israeli war. Work with me here. <laughs> right, yeah. So, uh, no, we do need to help Israel. Ukraine, I think, look, you've had people that are widely not very supportive of that. I think that the president... Uh, President Trump has said this correctly. We need to stop the killing. We need to f come to some type of peace settlement negotiation as quickly as we can because we can't have all of our attention and resources constantly divided. When we have the biggest threat this country has ever faced, you know, the United States has never gone to war with a peer competitor as it relates to the size of their economy, ever. We've never beat one. We've never done that. We've never gone to war with a nation by population as large as China. This is something we have never contended with, and God willing, we never end up in some conventional conflict with China, but it has to be addressed politically, economically, and militarily. We have to address this issue that we have right now with China. Riley, I think what I heard you say that you would have voted against funds going to Ukraine. Yes. Um, I think that the Biden administration has not articulated a strategy to me. Like, what, what, what is our end goal? And I said, it, it keeps kind of moving. At one point, it's to help them defend their territory, territorial integrity. Now you have people talking about the overthrow and defeat of Putin. So let's walk that out a little bit. What does that look like? Okay. So we depose Putin, the country uh, crumbles, you have 20,000 loose nukes running around the, the eight time zones in Russia. Who's gonna go in and secure those? Who's gonna do the peacekeeping operations and stability operations within Russia to ensure that those types of items are secured? Oh, I guess that's gonna be us. So if we're the ones doing that, how are we going to find ourselves more focused on things like China? Now, if you're talking about our strategy is to try to come to some peace settlement, which, by the way, has been widely reported. It was scuttled by the Biden administration. For what reason? I'm not sure. 
Uh, that's what we want right now. We want peace. We want peace in Ukraine. Um, but, but wasn't part of that peace settlement Ukraine giving up some of their own yeah. territory? Are you talking about country? Crimea? They've had it for 10 years. But there's there are Russians beyond Crimea in the Ukraine right now. Yeah, I'm not sure what the exact details of it were, but Biden and Obama gave Crimea up in 2014. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you, again, Crimea aside, there are... Russians along that eastern border like in the right Donbass yeah. yes yes obviously there is but I'm not sure what that deal on the table looked like it wasn't released publicly to any of us it's all kind of innuendo of what it exactly looked like but yes we need to if part of this if you're funding the Ukrainian military is to try and put them in the best position to negotiate peace and, and maintain the best situation that relates to the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Hey, let's talk about the southern border mm -hmm. and uh, how would uh, Congressman Riley Moore vote along the lines of uh, establishing security once again along that line? Yeah, you know, this is an interesting topic because it always, when you talk about border security, someone says, well, what about immigration reform? I don't even want to talk about immigration reform. I'm one of those people who bring them up because yeah. I think they're tied. I don't. And that's the reason we've not been able to secure the border, because every time we talk about border security, somebody says immigration reform, and you're trying to do these two things that, look, the closest you ever got on that was 2006 with the Bush administration, which, by the way, Bernie Sanders voted against that, uh, but you didn't get the immigration reform and border security. We've proven now for over 20 years we can't do those two things. So let's do one of them, and if we're going to do one of them, let's secure the border. Build the wall. Well, I don't disagree with that. I, I think you can do them separately, but I do think if you want to solve the border problem, immigration reform long-term has to be a part of that. Yeah, but every time you talk about border security, the Democrats come in and say, well, immigration reform has to be part of it. It does not have to be part of it. What we have to do is secure the border first, then we can talk about immigration reform. But didn't Senator Lankford's bill address border security as well as immigration reform? I wouldn't say in a meaningful manner. No, not at all. Uh, not to me. I, I think you need to have a hard border. We need to have ISR assets down there. What's happening down there is an absolute tragedy that we're incentivizing right now. Did you know there's people that come over the border and there's... Th hundreds of thousands of these things now, these bracelets that get thrown off at the border and they're color coded. Do you know what the color coding is? Hmm. Is how much you owe the cartel. Each person has to wear a bracelet of how much they owe the cartel. So you're wondering why crime is rampant right now and it's thousands, it can run from 3,000 to 12,000 to 20,000 dollars depending on the size of your family, the individual and so forth. They come into this country and these young folks need to come up with that money because the cartels will kill them mm -hmm. if they do not. That's why you're getting all this crime all over our cities right now. You know how much it is for a Chinese citizen to come over that border? $50,000. Those bracelets are there too. A lot of Chinese coming over the border. Yeah, there was a big 60 Minutes uh, episode on that about two months ago. Yeah. So exactly. they're paying $50,000. This is what I'm saying. We have a security issue at the border that we sorry that we have to take care of now like right now this is an immediate issue we will deal with immigration reform later all right we spend way more money than we take in in this country it's also affecting many things including inflation but it's also going to affect long-term social security and medicare and that cliff was recently pushed back a couple of years on a recent report but it's still there hanging out waiting to be solved what do you do yeah, I mean, look, we're going to be upside down, right? Your generation, uh, baby boomers, <clears throat> there's more of you than there are of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we will be upside down in that equation here at some point. The nature of retirement in this country has changed dramatically, right? So like the Admiral here, he's, I take it probably on TRICARE or something like that. Most people, when they retire now that are on fixed income, have no health care and they're going to be living longer right so we have to start to think what does that look like what are we going to do i this idea of cutting social security i am not for that president trump is not for that i am not for that we have to think about because one way or another you're going to be paying for it you mm -hmm. know one way or another we're going to be paying for it so obviously we have to reach some level of solvency but there is some alternative ideas that have been put out there 
I'm not saying this is one of my ideas, but there are some people thinking outside the box on this. So I'll give you an example. Uh, government workers, state of West Virginia, federal or otherwise, have, um, <clears throat> and you're probably familiar, well, I don't know if the military has it, but federal guys um, outside of the military. So obviously you have your pension, but then on top of that, they have their TSP, which is like right. a government-run... Uh, thrift for, savings, it's called yeah, thrift savings plan. Thrift, yeah. thrift savings plan, yeah. exactly. We have that on the state level too, 457. Uh, I run that program. It's 401k supplemental program. Someone uh, recently, and I can't remember, I read this, said, well, what if, you know, when, I don't know, a child's born or something like that, we just drop $1,000, whatever that number is, into a 401k and just kind of start that kind of net. I mean, if money's there to kind of start to incentivize them, just like a 529, right? I mean, we start them early, like when they're kids. Sure. And just kind of start to m get them to save a little bit more because there does have to be essentially at some point some limit as it relates to how many Social Security benefits, like a cap, right? And obviously there is a cap currently on that in terms of what we can expend. Maybe moving that cap down in terms of the um, maximum expenditures it relates to Social Security while still covering everybody, but then trying to come up with this supplemental type thing that we could get people into. Now, I've heard a lot of reasons why that's not a good idea, uh, but I, I, I like the creativity of it, I guess is what I'd say. We have a minute and a half left, 90 seconds. Tell people why they should vote for you. Well, as I said at the outset of this, uh, I'm the proven conservative in this race. If you're wondering how I'm going to vote when I'm in Congress, I would take a look at my voting record uh, when I was in the state legislature. I had one of the most conservative voting records. In the state legislature, I was proud to be there and serve this district, which was the 67th at the time. I think it's now the 100th. But um, as your state treasurer, I fought back and won against the uh, corporate liberal elites in this country, protecting coal, gas, and oil, and our jobs and economy, and our Second Amendment rights. So if you want to learn more about my campaign, you can go to moreforwv.com or go to Riley Moore, WV, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Please vote more in 24. Thank you. Where will you be spending your election day night? Uh, we will be at the Inn at Charlestown. Uh, that's the hotel there, you know, at the casino. Uh, so that's where we will be. Thanks for dropping by. No, thanks for having me. It's always great being here. Riley Moore, candidate for Congress, currently a state treasurer, too. That is a congressional district uh, number two.